Welcome to The Mortarboard, the administrator's source for solutions in higher education. We tell you about challenges other schools have faced, benchmark the problem, share their best practices and epic fails, and invite you to consider whether what worked for them might also work at your institution. Hosted by longtime college president Dr. Dan Barwick, this is The Mortarboard, the source for solutions in higher education. Welcome to The Mortarboard, your source for solutions in higher education. I'm Dan Barwick. Welcome to the podcast. If the content of this podcast interests you, then you'll enjoy my new book, Risk and Reward, How Small Colleges Get Better Against the Odds. It's now available from Amazon in ebook, paperback, and audiobook format. The best way to find it is to head over to my blog, mortarboardblog.com, and click on the link on the front page. If you have any thoughts about the book, don't hesitate to send me an email and let me know what you think. Today's episode is the third part of our three-part series on tenure. My guest today is Molly Worthen, an associate professor of history at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. Her research focuses on North American religious and intellectual history. Her most recent book, Apostles of Reason, examines American evangelical intellectual life since 1945. She recently released an audio course for Audible called Charismatic Leaders Who Remade America and is currently writing a book on that subject. She has been a contributor at the New York Times since 2007 and has also written about religion and politics for The New Yorker, Slate, Foreign Policy, and other publications. Her latest contribution to The New York Times is her article, The Fight Over Tenure is Not Really About Tenure. Professor Worthen, welcome to the podcast. Thanks for having me. You began your article by asking, and now I'm going to quote you here, Why should universities guarantee jobs to a bunch of elitists who study esoteric subjects and brainwash students with left-wing politics? This critique of tenure in higher education is as old as tenure itself, and it's gaining ground, end quote. Let me begin by shifting the point of view from outsiders to insiders. I've discussed tenure with literally hundreds of faculty, and tenured faculty privately tell me, that they know tenure is unusual, and although, you know, they'll take it if it's available, most of them think it's a bad system that creates bad outcomes. How could tenure be revised to address the concerns you've raised in that quote while still satisfying academics? I think it's difficult to make any kind of global recommendation that would apply uh, in, a, in a productive way to every institution. And especially in American higher education, we have such a wide range of institutions with different missions and uh, you know different student bodies, different administrative and institutional structures that I think the, the way to reform tenure and make it work better is, is going to be different in every at every school. And, and perhaps that's obvious, but it's worth stating at the outset. And to me, the, the, the big problems are that the incentives are generally misaligned with our institutional goals. Um, and, and I know this is a generalization and there are, there are institutions who have, I think, successfully tweaked the balance of evaluation of, of research and service and teaching to better align with what they're trying to do. And when I published that article, I, you know, I heard from a few uh, faculty members who are really quite happy with, with how their institutions evaluate every part of their work. But I heard from many others, let's say the majority of, of those who, who wrote to me uh, did so to echo my sense that, frankly, it's amazing that as many uh, professors in higher education are as invested in teaching and spend as much time on our teaching, revising our lectures, revising our our lesson plans as we do, given the paucity of institutional rewards for yeah, that's just a fascinating point. Work. I mean, is it our vanity? I mean, why do we do it? Because you know, it seems to me that while there's lip service paid to teaching uh, at, at research institutions and at the growing number of liberal arts colleges that perhaps began as teaching centric institutions, but increasingly have adopted a lot of the conventions of the larger research universities. I mean, there's lip service paid to teaching in, uh, you know, tenure review 
But it seems to me that it's very, very unusual, short of, you know, criminal negligence in the classroom for concerns about teaching to hold up a tenure case. Uh, the, you know, the issues that really become roadblocks are, are usually to do with, with research. So in, in my article, I was trying to think through ways in which uh, we, especially those of us who teach outside the hard sciences, where I do think tenure is, is more important, uh, ways we can think through uh, uh, new approaches to our teaching and, and whether there's room for more imaginative rewards for teaching beyond your comfort zone, revising your classes, putting your time and effort into the classroom um, and, and as part of the tenure uh, re- review process. And on top of that, I recognize that, of course, a, a small minority of teachers in higher education in the United States even have tenure or are on, on track to receive it. It's only a third of us, and that's including those who are on tenure track but not yet tenured. And therefore, we need to think about ways to extend the benefits of tenure to everybody, particularly academic freedom. And so part of what I was thinking through in the article as well is ways in which the attitudes of the administration um, might shift to to make academic freedom a, a real experience for people, whether or not they're on the tenure track. Well, you know, when you talk about the lack of reward for teaching, um, you know, on the one hand, it shows the commitment that, you know, faculty have to the craft of teaching that they focus on it, uh, even when the institution itself is not particularly focused on it. Um, I have mentioned this story, I think at least once before on the show, uh, my uh, graduate school roommate got a job interview and uh, a subsequent job offer at uh, a school when he w- when he was done with graduate school and when and this was a private four year uh, liberal arts college and when he met with his department chair and his department chair said well you know I see my job as making sure you get tenure and so my my friend said okay so what what do you see as necessary and the department chair looked at him and said well two articles, an average of two articles per year in peer-reviewed journals. My friend sort of looked at him and then hesitantly said, well, to what extent does does teaching contribute to the tenure portfolio? And the department chair just looked at him, blinked, and said, an average of two articles per year in peer-reviewed journals. Wow. So my, my roommate came home, actually, from that discussion, you know, a little bit depressed um, because I knew that he was very, you know, very focused on teaching and teaching quality. I, in the end, I think that it it did happen that some of his teaching was certainly taken into consideration. But I think that his chair was being honest with him. Let me return to the article. You also wrote that tenure's defenders have said that. And once again, I'm going to quote you here. Tenure does not grant a teacher a job for life but simply protection from arbitrary firing and retribution. It safeguards academic freedom, end quote. Now, when I read that, (laughs) my very first thought was, I wonder what administrators and faculty in specific states would think of that sentence. Um, I've worked in states in which tenure was far, far more than protection from arbitrary firing. The, these states' policies were the origin of that, you know, that cliched view that tenure provides, you know, lifetime employment. Even in cases where a faculty member would lose his or her job in any other normal workplace, you know, if they worked at Home Depot, the laws regarding due process in a, in a higher education made removing a bad teacher nearly impossible. And even when it was technically possible, the cost to the institution in terms of time and money, it clearly dissuaded the institution in all but the most egregious cases. I wondered how you see a middle ground, uh, whether or not such a middle ground could be reached, where where you've you've safeguarded academic freedom, but at the same time, you've you've created a system in which teachers can be realistically accountable for anything from their productivity to their work habits, to their interaction with students, any, any way, any normal way that a teacher would be evaluated. That's a great question. I think it highlights the way in which the meaning of tenure varies very much depending on, on, on state law. If we're talking about public institutions and, and even more so 
tenure is only as strong as the institution that supports it. I'm not sure that uh, outrageous firings of tenured professors on dubious grounds are quite as unusual as you suggest. And I don't think it takes too many of them to have a really quite chilling effect on the rest of us. I'm thinking of the recent case this past spring of Daniel Pollock Pelsner uh, at Linfield uh, College in, or University in Oregon, who was placed on mandatory leave for essentially criticizing the uh, governance, the governing board of the university and the president uh, for how they mishandled uh, sexual assault charges, among other things. And the the president just very very calmly uh, rode over, you know, the 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 letter of the law in terms of due, the due process that Pollock Pelsner was entitled to, and that case is still ongoing. Or what last year, um, the case of the journalism professor at Central Michigan University, Tim Boudreau, who was fired for quoting a court case that included as part of the quotation the N word. So, I mean, that to me is 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 a pretty uh, striking case, and there have been others. So, you know, certainly we're not talking about a, an enormous number of cases, but um, these cases of outright uh, firing or or putting people on mandatory leave, as as well as uh, you know the the sort of the the atmosphere that can develop in some states, including my own, in which we are increasingly expecting a certain level of political interference in tenure review by governing boards. I mean, these, these, are, these are factors that I think uh, demonstrate the degree to which the institution is, is under a threat. And this makes it all the more important to me to think through the real flaws in tenure. It's very difficult to make the case to, uh, you know, state politicians or, you know, people in the general public who do see it as you characterized it, a kind of a a ridiculous level of labor protection that applies to virtually no other category of employee. Uh, It's important to uh, be able to make the case for tenure uh, to its critics in an honest way. And I don't want to be in the position of defending an institution that doesn't work very well. I will simply add, though, that our perspective in the United States is a little bit skewed. Uh, Employees have the fewest protections, generally speaking, uh, in the culture of American labor law than in any of our peer countries. And this is not to say that tenure doesn't have its critics in the United Kingdom or Canada or other European countries, but um, the the baseline level of protection against arbitrary firing for everybody is far higher in those countries. And so this is why uh, those few categories of employees who have significant protections in this country, whether they're uh, unionized workers or or tenured teachers in in primary or higher education, we are easy scapegoats because the average employee in the United States has it so bad. You wrote in the article, quote, the fight over tenure is not really about tenure. It's a proxy for a larger debate about the meaning of academic freedom and the priorities of higher education, end quote. Now, juxtapose that with the figures you gave about the number of academics that are actually eligible for tenure. So I think you put it at about 30%. How should we approach this issue? Now, I'm going to take for granted that academic freedom is desirable. Even if tenure were successfully defended, how should we actually create an environment of academic freedom for teachers while still preserving accountability. I ask this, I should tell you just a little bit of context. I ask that I'm certainly interested in hearing your views of academic freedom. And part of the reason for that is that the faculty that I interviewed, most of them feel that although they have tenure, they actually don't feel that the tenure has resulted in genuine academic freedom. Uh, And so I'm curious, um, how would you create an environment in which genuine academic freedom actually exists? I feel that way too. I am tenured and and it certainly does not mean that I feel uh, totally free to take on every controversial subject I would like to take on in the classroom or write about anything that interests me in my public writing. And 
gosh, why is that? I mean, I think <laughs> that, that that has to do with um, features of, of my university as an institution, and I think many, many American universities generally. And then maybe also it's, it's reflective of broader cultural factors that are harder to articulate and address. Uh, so... I wrote in the piece about uh, what I see as a real uh, problem of a culture of extreme risk aversion in academia. And I mean that on the part of, of faculty to some extent, but I'm, I'm most concerned about risk aversion on the part of administrators. And this is an old theme. I mean, ever since we've had colleges and universities in this country. We've had college presidents and other administrators who need to be worried about what alumni think and what trustees think and mainly what donors think. And in the case of public institutions, the relationships with uh, state politicians. And so we've always had uh, administrators who, you know, as part of their job, have to be attuned to risks to the institution's reputation and standing with these different stakeholders. But it, it seems to me that that uh, culture of extreme risk aversion, this need to issue a public statement every time there's some uh, relatively minor kerfuffle between student groups or you know around the controversial work of a professor, this idea that every uh, that statement by you know the president or chancellor has to be churned through an incredibly expensive PR machine to strip it of any personality and authenticity, but make sure that it doesn't offend anyone. I think this is something that's definitely gotten worse in the past few years, and it has to be connected to the rise of social media and the way that that social media amplifies the ugly words and and feelings of people who are upset about this or that incident on campus and perhaps gives it uh, an outsized power. Certainly that is what I heard from um, Adam Steinbaugh, lawyer at FIRE, uh, whom I talked to about this. I mean, he said, you know, Back in the day, you know, if there was a far left wing professor outraging local conservatives, the president would, you know, get a, f- a few letters from from grumpy, you know, people in the state. But now, you know, that those few letters have metastasized into Twitter campaigns that are then, you know, churned through uh, conservative media outlets that are really good at amplifying these things. And a version of that happens on the left too. I mean, his his point to me was that this is really bipartisan. That this 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 kind Kind of thing happens on both sides. And so I think if, if administrators, and this is a big request, and it's easy for me to make as a, as a lowly, you know, faculty member who's, you know, never had any serious institutional power in my life, but if it would be possible to just dial down uh, that impulse to respond to everything, and just let let you know the, the campus community sort out some of our disagreements on our own without having to always proclaim a, a public statement. I think that would go a long way to making everyone feel a little bit more comfortable uh, having having open civil conflict about things that matter to us. And I'm talking about students, faculty, staff, and administrators. Um, but this is a really a project of transforming an institutional culture that reflects some of the patterns we're seeing in our broader national culture. I mean, we know from surveying our students, and this is true at the national level, uh, organizations like the Knight Foundation have done these surveys. I, at, here at, at UNC, we've certainly done some surveys uh, that echo the national, the national studies. When we ask students uh, do you feel you can speak openly in class? You, know, you can ask the questions you want to ask. You can say what you think about controversial issues. A huge proportion, I mean, over half say say no. And that's not just conservative students. A, a good chunk of liberal students say that they self-censor as well. Yeah. And when we push further and we ask why, why do you self-center, a small proportion uh, will say that they're concerned, uh, blowback from a faculty member who might disagree with them. But a far larger proportion are worried about judgment from their peers. They're worried about peers posting on social media that their classmate is a bigot or, you know, whatever the, the epithet might be. And I think uh, in this culture of, of extreme polarization, when, uh, you know, our students are growing up in a media environment that totally demonizes 
the opponent and casts everything as black <laughs> and white and encourages us to reside in these independent universes of, of you know, separate claims to, to facts. Uh, we, we've really not done a good job at modeling for our students how you have a conversation with someone that you don't disagree with without letting it devolve into ad hominem attacks. And so, you know, so often we, we scapegoat universities, I think, for these broader cultural problems, um, uh, you know, problems that have to do with our students' preparation and their socioeconomic situations and their education long before they get to us. And this is perhaps another ca- another example of that. Um, this is this is how the university is reflecting some of these broader problems in our culture, and so it can it can feel paralyzing. What can we possibly do in the face of this? But I do think that you know an, a, an administrator has some agency uh, and, and doesn't have to you know do the easiest thing and kind of give in to these broad patterns that that really constrain free conversation. And, and, and academic freedom on campus. I think there, there is another way. When you talk about giving into broad patterns, I, I wanted to revisit something that you said earlier in your answer um, about the influence of donors. You're not the first guest on the podcast to draw a parallel between the diminish, diminishment of academic freedom and the rise of the donor class, for lack of a better description. Essentially, what people have observed to me is that, you know, a hundred years ago, except for very, you know, elite private schools, uh, schools didn't fundraise the way they do now. And as money, uh, public money becomes tighter and tighter, schools become more and more dependent on the money that is provided by philanthropists and presumably they they believe that those philanthropists will only provide that money or continue to provide that money if there is general approval of of the school and and what it's doing i wondered if you could talk a bit about the effect that you may see of philanthropy on academic freedom this is a really important question, and I think it's one that's on it's on a lot of faculty's minds at my own institution, and I, I know we're not alone for precisely the reasons you say. We do feel more and more dependent on private money, and as the, the trend that really began in the 1980s of public defunding of public institutions continues, um, and we are, we are seeing what is really a very old pattern that goes back more than 100 years of... of um, you know, this, the sense among donors that giving the money should, should entitle them to a lot more influence on hiring and curricular decisions than contemporary standards of academic freedom permit. I think that we're, we're seeing um, a couple of things happen. Uh, We're seeing universities become savvier to some extent about how they write their donor agreements. Certainly what I'm seeing at UNC is, is that our donor agreements have changed over the past 10 years in an awareness that the institution has to be out ahead of this and has to really adjust donor expectations. But that doesn't eliminate the source of conflict, which perhaps will always be there. Um, you know, I'm not sure. From I can kind of see the donor's perspective in a general sense, um, and it has to be balanced against other goods. Um, so, you know, at, at UNC, we're, we're coming out of a period of, of some controversy that was partially fed by, uh, you know, what is now public knowledge that the main donor for our journalism school. Um, was very opinionated about the, the possibility of UNC hiring the uh, New York Times journalist, Nicole Hannah-Jones. So that certainly still happens. The other interesting pattern, though, that I'm seeing is, at least anecdotally, with some donors, uh, they are learning as well. And so the, the uh, Koch Foundation is an example of this. Um, I mean, my understanding is that in the early years of their uh, philanthropy in higher education, they had very high expectations of the level of kind of political return on investment and the level of control that they would have. 
But in kind of informal conversations that I've had with people who who are associated with with grants they're supporting now, they have realized that they overstepped and that it ultimately re- redounds to the detriment of the foundation if they are if they come to have the reputation a, a, as a, a meddling institution that doesn't allow you know the, the scholarship to to flourish in a in a way that is free of political interference it, it undermines their aim to you know have scholarship they support be taken seriously so i i see some some hopeful signs of 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 correction uh, like this but the broader the broader outlook is uh is very discouraging and i think um at most universities, there's probably not enough candid conversation about the role of ideology in funding on both sides of the political spectrum. I mean, I, I see a lot of uh, hand wringing and worry, uh, you know, at institutions like mine about conservative money. I think I think ideology on the other side of the spectrum is certainly present in in funding and institutional priorities as well. And, and if, if we're going to, you know, use a, a donation by a conservative family foundation as a, an occasion to open a public conversation about the role of ideology and private donors in our curricular decisions, we should open that conversation broadly and not just confine it to to one case that that suits the you know the the, the political uh, preferences of, of of some of the faculty. I don't think there's an easy solution uh, to the problems that you raise hmm. uh, b- because hmm. there's because the public money is drying up. You'll be happy to know that uh, I'm finally going to make use of you as a history professor, which is what you are. I was intrigued by the point you made in your article when you claimed that the debate over tenure was partly about left-wing politics. So my first thought was that the le- isn't the left-wing issue a, a fairly recent phenomena? Uh, but you point out that the American Association of University Professors drafted its first statement on tenure in 1915 and refined it in 1940 in response to the academic labor market and political pressures on faculty members who were suspected of subversive left-leaning teaching. Apparently, the political divide between academics and politics at large have persisted for some time. That's absolutely right. I mean, you know, historians, we love to say, there's nothing new here. This is just, you know, a a repeat of what we've seen before. And of course, of course, every age has its own particular challenges. But but this broad pattern is one that has been in place in this country for more than a century. I mean, as long for the whole period in which you can talk about anything resembling modern American universities, you can find that pattern of uh, conservative donors and trustees and and local politicians being upset with left-leaning faculty it, it goes back it goes back all the way i mean the you know the one of the more famous cases in the first decade of the 20th century is the edward ross case at stanford edward ross uh, was a i believe he was an economist who was very critical of the railroad industry. And uh, he was a progressive and a eugenicist, as, as many progressives were then, someone who believed in a kind of racial hierarchy and, and had ideas that, that um, we would now consider very objectionable about the kind of level of policy interference to kind of control um, which, which people have children and how to kind of purify our race. But he got into a uh, a fight, or rather, he earned the ire of Leland Stanford's widow, who, of course, owed her fortune to the railroad industry and was upset with him for objecting to her use of Chinese labor. Um, so, I think it's easy to become distracted by the by the eugenicist piece of it. We need to acknowledge that, but the broader the broader pattern is this. Uh, 
a progressive critic of big railroads who who earned the anger of the you know the rich widow and ends up having to resign from Stanford. That same pattern is carried over. I mean, you'd be hard pressed to find a, an example among these early academic freedom cases where it's not a, a progressive faculty member either in his scholarship or in extramural speech. Uh, earning the ire of conservatives. I mean, the the case in the in the 1920s that that really uh, begins the shift in uh, the elite academia toward privileging research over teaching and other aspects of tenure review began with uh, the the president of Harvard needing to get rid of two very popular economics professors who were progressive in their views. Uh, and it, it was seemed at the time to uh, people who were observing this case that they were being punished for their politics. So that's a really old pattern. And it, it kind of um, ebbs and flows. And certainly we see uh, extreme, uh, more widespread cases of, of that kind of uh, th- uh, threat to professors' academic freedom during the you know the periods we associate with red scares you know the the 19 teens and the in the, the period around Joseph McCarthy's red baiting um, and and so I, that that has really shaped I think the the narrative that faculty have in their mind um, as well as um, sort of the, the broad outlines of, of of these protections as both needing to include academic work but also you know things we say outside the classroom. Uh, and needing to kind of make it an attractive, uh, an attractive profession for professionals who, at least in some fields, not always sort of have um, other economic options. And the university, in most cases, cannot compete um, through a salary that's higher than the private sector for an economist or or some of these other fields. And so it's supposed to, you know, the hope is to offer this arena in which you can at least express yourself. Professor Worthen, I'm a philosophy professor. And so, you know, I'm sympathetic to the notion that we need to be able to talk about big ideas. You closed your article with a passage that I will admit brought a tear to my eye. And I'm going to quote you here. But if the alternative is cynicism and inaction, we might as well try small steps that challenge academia's culture of extreme risk aversion. Universities have the power to call the tenure system back to its original purpose, to permit teachers to explore big ideas, take risks in the classroom, and show our students just how adventurous the life of the mind can be, end quote, and hear, hear. What then are these small steps you're referring to? I am not someone who... uh jumps on the bandwagon of the interdisciplinarity trend lightly. I think that's a that's a word, interdisciplinarity, that we toss around and it's just automatically good and it's often not clear what what we mean by it. Um, it can, I think, collaboration across disciplines can be shallow as as frequently or more frequently as it is substantive. However, I, I'm intrigued by it. I'm experimenting with uh, co-teaching across disciplines here at UNC. And I think it would be interesting to, to build into the tenure review process some incentive for faculty to connect their area of study to broader, broader research areas within their discipline and in allied disciplines. Uh, and to make that an, an explicit part of what it means to to grow as a faculty member, I think it redounds to the benefit of of the teacher, um, not just the students. Maybe more the teacher than the students. Sometimes I'll I'll find out when I you know I, I start reading the papers in midterms of this class I'm teaching with a physicist that a guy in the German literature department whether the students have been able to connect the dots at all. But I know I'm learning a lot. Um, and I think I, I don't see that that uh, at, at most ins- institutions and I haven't done a uh, extensive comprehensive review, only kind of trading on the anecdotal evidence I, I have from uh, myself and colleagues. I don't I don't see much incentive in the tenure process to do anything beyond 
teach the minimum number of courses you can get away with that are that are really comfortably in your wheelhouse. I would also love to see more explicit incentive, incentivization by the institution up to tenure and beyond uh, to encourage faculty to, to, to not just teach outside their comfort zone, but also continually revise their courses. And I think that's the sort of thing that kind of happens here and there. You know, the, an institution will have some, uh, you know, tr- trendy cause. Maybe there's a, you know, desire to, to make courses more international. And, and so there's a little pot of money available for faculty who will bring a, an international global dimension to a course that was before that more domestic and orientation. But this is a sort of one-off thing. It's not really part of an institutional culture. I would just love to have more room as a faculty member to try to be a bit more of a generalist. Uh, I, I stand by the value of our uh, focused research. I think it's important. I don't mean to, to denigrate it. Um, I, think, I think it can be valuable in the classroom too, as we seek to kind of model for students what it means to, to glimpse mastery of a subject. We have to get beyond surface you know, general teaching and show them what it's like to do a deep dive into a specific area. But maybe we don't always do a good job of balancing that with a commitment to communicating the broad insights and questions of our discipline to, to a, a non-specialist audience and, and making the, the case to students that uh, there, is, there, there are insights here that, that apply to a whole worldview. So I, I guess I, I think that there are ways for uh, individuals and, and at the department level and, and then, you know, further up the chain in terms of reconceptualizing the tenure review process, there are small places at each of these levels to rethink the culture of teaching and its relationship to research. My guest today has been Professor Molly Worthen, an historian at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill who writes frequently about higher education. Professor Worthen, thanks for joining us today. Thanks for having me. Thanks for joining me. Please feel free to email me with questions, comments, or suggestions for content that you'd like to hear about. You can reach me at mortarboardpodcast at gmail.com. Consider stopping by my blog, motorboardblog.com. The blog contains links to stories that I think will interest you, podcast transcripts, and articles I've written. You can also like me on Facebook at Dr. Daniel Barwick or follow me on Twitter at Daniel Barwick. Looking forward to talking with you in the next episode.